I think we're going to go ahead and get the program started. Um, we've got a tight agenda today, and I think uh, we, we're going to have some questions, and we'll leave plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. So welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us during this Bladder Cancer Awareness Month. I just had the pleasure last weekend of joining Andrea Maddox-Smith, who's sitting over there in our audience in a humongous uh, Beacon uh, Walk in Houston. We've got another one coming up here in Baltimore tomorrow, and it's not too late for you to join us. Um, we'll be happy to provide you with any information you might need to, uh, to join us there. And uh, I also wanted to um, introduce our panel today, just in case you didn't know them. And uh, on my right here, your left, is Stephanie Greenberg. You know, all know Stephanie. And next to her is Noah Hahn, a very important and prominent medical oncologist. Next to him is another very important and prominent medical oncologist, Gene Hoffman Census. Uh, we recently grabbed from another institution up in Philadelphia. And last but not least, uh, Max Cates, rock star surgeon. Uh, and he'll be telling us more about the surgery component of uh, what what we're doing in clinical trials today. So just as a brief update, Stephanie's going to give you a little update as well. Um, we've come out of the gates trying to be as aggressive as we can be uh, in creating a, an environment here that would be uh, impactful both primarily for clinical management of patients with bladder cancer. And you'll hear a lot more about that today. Uh, but also research. And as part of our research effort, we uh, submitted a proposal to become what's known as a Precision Medicine Center of Excellence, or otherwise known as PIMCO or PMCOE. This is a Johns Hopkins initiative that's designed to really try to integrate the highest quality science into uh, the clinical workflows. It's a competitive process. Uh, fortunately, Ken Pienta, who's a close collaborator of ours, had already gone through this process for prostate cancer and had initiated one of the first PIMCOs and prostate cancer year before. Happy to tell you that we were approved and we're active and up and running and now uh, we're being micromanaged by a team of experts ranging from uh, engineers and, and data acquisition experts and telemedicine experts and a lot of other talented people here at Hopkins to really ramp up our precision medicine efforts uh, which, of course, involve sequencing, but they also involve a lot of clinical data collection uh, techniques, maybe for getting more out of our conventional pathology than we're getting right now using machine learning and other approaches. So stay tuned. Maybe we'll have an update on that next year. So I'm going to turn it over now to Stephanie Greenberg to give you a little bit of a welcome as well. Stephanie? Thank you all. So um, I wanted to give you an update on what we've been working on in the past year. Um, sometimes it's really, things go really fast here, which is delightful. And sometimes they're a little slower than we like. But we, I promise you, every day we're out there trying to make the patient experience for those with bladder cancer better. And that's our number one goal here. And we have this wonderful team here and many more in the room who care for you and care for bladder cancer patients who are uh, really devoted to that effort. But big institutions are big, and sometimes it just takes time to get everything done. So uh, uh, just to give you an update on what's happened really in the past year, there's some many, been some uh, a few really uh, important people joining the team, because this is about people after all. So Dr. Choi has joined us from MD Anderson, and she's a world expert in uh, sequencing and genomics. So she's a researcher. And so although behind the scenes, she's very integral to, to what, uh, the, what happens here. And uh, it, I, I promise you, although I can't explain it as well as these people can, it does benefit our patients um, measurably. Then we're delighted to welcome Jeannie Hoffman Census, who comes to us from Philadelphia. Um, uh, having Jeannie here has just been uh, transforming, and you'll hear from her yourself. But um, again, this is about people who help make this happen. And Jeannie joining the team has just been nothing short of remarkable, and she only came here in February. We also have Catherine Cageman, who works with NOAA. She's in the room somewhere. And it's the nurses, the uh, patient navigators, the 
uh, Joanne Walkers of the world, the urology nurses, everyone that you have maybe uh, had the pleasure of coming in contact with who make this all happen. So we're trying it, uh, hard to hire more people and um, that is a lengthy process, but it's happening. And so I hope by next time, this time next year, we can have them here with us. But that's there's a big plan to um, bring in more people to help with this effort. We also have Johnny, the computer guy, who, oh, thank God for Johnny. Um, Johnny, the website, how does it work? Can you do it? We have a brand new website that Johnny really sort of took over and revolutionized. He's super young. I've asked him stupid questions about my own passwords and things like that. So Johnny is just as important as everyone else in the room, and he's here t today. Um, there have been a few. Uh, this team is really modest. Um, as an outside person, I just like love immodesty and you know I'm totally um, obnoxious but they've won many uh, awards this year and you know you have to kind of tease it out of them but there have been two Department of Defense awards of which Dr. McConkie is uh, the principal investigator Dr. Bivalacqua has won several uh, grants and awards and the team has also done that so not in, in addition to be clinician scientists they're also award-winning scientists which helps them sort of transform the work they do um, uh, after they in the clinic all day or doing surgery. They're also doing remarkable um, science and medicine and winning awards for it and grants. Um, uh, in March, there was an incredible uh, conference that I give David full credit for organizing with our friends at the American Urological Association in this very room uh, and across the street for two days in March. They had. Uh, over 70, I think, world experts on non-muscle invasive bladder cancer come and convene. It was, it was a very scientific meeting. They had investigators from Sweden and the Netherlands and France and uh, the UK come here to Hopkins and talk only about that special pa space of res doing research and collaborating on better serving patients with non-muscle invasive disease. It came up very quickly, it was very, very successful, and it sort of put the Institute on the map for uh, charting new waters in, in, in that field, in that area of bladder cancer, which um, many feel has been sort of under, under underserved. So that was a really exciting moment for this institute and the science that will follow. And again, I promise you, people came from all over. It was freezing cold, it was rainy, it wasn't Baltimore at its best, but they came anyway, and it was a really successful conference. That conference will either be on an annual or uh, every other year basis, and it's going to happen again. We have, uh, thanks to David uh, and the team, there are uh, collaborators from all over the world who are already working on the science part. Science translates to patient care. So we have a, a friend in Paris who's a French pathologist who's sharing her data and her slides. There's researchers in the UK and across the spectrum who are on a daily basis working with our investigators. And that is so thrilling, um, given the fact that David hasn't even been here for two years. So, you know, we're really in a hurry, but that's pretty cool to say. Um, David mentioned the Precision Medicine Center of Excellence, which is somewhat of a mouthful. What it means is that patients will come to a one-stop shop where they are able to um, uh, be seen and uh, collaborate and, 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 and uh, conference with everyone who would have anything to do with their care rather than having an appointment here, an appointment there, and urology and oncology, and, you know, you're just all over the place. It's, it's just uh, corralling, um, it's like herding all the cats so that when you come, you're in one place with all your information in one place and all important decisions can be made in one place at one time. It's a better patient experience. I'm happy to report it's going to be um, housed in the new, brand new building that's like, you probably drove up and couldn't believe your eyeballs. There's a whole new cancer building that is just opening in the next day or two, or week or two. And uh, it will, the, the new precision, the multidisciplinary clinic for bladder cancer will be housed over there. And it's set up for that purpose, which is unbelievably exciting and it will be better for patients. Um, David mentioned the uh, sequencing activities that have been ongoing uh, since the moment he arrived. We have a beautiful laboratory. Uh, we're happy to show it to you. And with all this really cool equipment, as an outsider, I think it's, you know, there are beakers and there's like this machine that sequences stuff and it's totally cool. And it, um, the information, most, support, most importantly, 
is valuable for patients and their care and research into all these different aspects of bladder cancer. Jeannie is here and will mention the um, uh, serious efforts to establish, hopefully by this fall, um, the first women's bladder cancer center at our partner hospital, Sibley, in Washington, D.C. We have Armin Smith, who is a female uh, urologic surgeon, and Jeannie will be seeing patients down there. We felt that there was a void and need for women to be seen, if they choose, in a more sort of uh, female-centric environment. Uh, because, as you all know, bladder cancer is um, somewhat sensitive, and it's nice to have the option of, uh, for a woman to um, have a female surgeon or an oncologist. And finally, um, a special shout out to the very fabulous Anne Marie, who is our uh, titular ambassador. She is uh, leading the Beacon Walk tomorrow. She's uh, a source of joy and inspiration to all of us. So thank you, Anne Marie, for doing that. Uh, the Beacon Walk, you can still come. And um, uh, also the support group. We are trying to put that together, all the pieces. There's, it's, this is where it gets complicated in a big institution. But uh, by fall, we hope to expand the offerings, have them more specific, and also thanks to um, conduct some surveys on what you really want to hear about in these support group meetings. And so, and we, we may sort of, um, the plan is also to maybe categorize them according to um, interest and also stage of disease. So. Thank you for your patience in that department. It's been slow, admittedly, but um, it requires uh, 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 our, to become a buddy to a, uh, another bladder cancer patient. You, you also need to become a volunteer of Johns Hopkins. And believe it or not, that's where it gets a little sticky, but we're working on making it easy for you. So thank you for your patience. We wish you a happy, good, healthy summer. And uh, we'll be providing all these updates uh, as the year goes on. And, um, Year to year, we hope to bring you better news. So without enough of me, here's Noah. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Stephanie and David. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about clinical trials, but I wanted to just sort of say a couple things uh, dovetailing on David and uh, Stephanie's comments. Um, one of the, I would say, one of the funnest things about being part of the Institute is the people that are involved in it. And I think Stephanie pointed out a couple of new people that are, are here. Um, you know, you, you get to see us up here kind of talk about the different aspects of the Institute, but the thing that, that, that we get to enjoy day to day are all the people that are supporting us doing it. Um, and it's been really fun to see it continue to build. Um, you mentioned the new people in the last six months. Um, there's more to come. Um, and so, you know, we're hoping that that's all part of the broader vision of what we're trying to accomplish. But as it feeds into the clinical trials aspect, um, the other thing that I noticed about this particular event that's, that's gratifying for me is, number one, there are some familiar faces that we've seen before. What that means to me is that people with bladder cancer and their families are doing much better than ever before, and that's really, really great to see. Um, I can't tell you how much that drives us to keep working harder. Um, the second thing is that there are some new faces here today. So to me, I'm taking that as a, as a sign that the word is getting out, that there is interesting things going on in the Institute and that there are inst places like Hopkins and the GBCI um, that are here to help. So I, I thank you all for that. That, that. That's the fuel for us to keep going. Um, as far as the clinical trials go, I want to just mention a couple of things. Um, I think on the handouts and coming in today, there were, were some materials for you that was a little bit um, kind of a clinical trials prospectus, so to speak, of what's available here at, at Hopkins and at the Institute. Um, and I think what you'll see is that there's a broad array of trials. Um, what we're aiming to do is to try to provide a trial option for every patient at every step of their journey of bladder cancer, from initial diagnosis to treatments in the non-muscle invasive setting to muscle invasive patients, pre, post therapies, and to advanced uh, cancer patients uh, all along the way, frontline, second line, additional therapies. Um, I think you'll notice that there's an array of types of treatments. Um, there are some novel agents that are being used for local disease in the bladder. There are many treatments that are taking advantage and harnessing some of the newer immune therapies that we've learned in advanced patients and trying to move them up. And then there are some trials that are trying to harness some of the testing of the tumor genes that we talk about, the so-called genomics. Uh, of the cancer to try to give patients individual options. Um, 
So that's a good thing, and that's a, that's a changing thing that, that changes over time. Um, the second thing that, that I want to mention, uh, going back to Johnny, the computer guy, is that you will see these trials actually appearing now, um, some links through the GBCI website to try to keep that up to date, you know, as a portal for patients, both from an information standpoint. Um, I would recommend to check that often. Um, the clinical trials landscape is, it does change fast. Uh, I can tell you even this week, uh, two of the trials that we have have kind of met their landmark. And so the next two to three weeks, there'll probably be some new ones replacing those. Um, but for patients and their families for clinical trials, I'm only going to touch on just a couple very short, broad topics, and then I'd be happy to take questions at the end. But um, we believe that clinical trials are the way to progress and that they are the way to improved outcomes for patients. Um, one thing I want to just make sure for patients is that they understand some basic terminology about clinical trials, because it can get really complicated when you look on the websites that list all of the trials that are available. And in general terms, trials come in three phases. Um, phase one is generally when we've got a drug or an approach that is being tested primarily for safety. It doesn't mean that it's the first time that it's ever been put in a human being. Some phase ones are literally that, but most are not. Most are trying to use a drug or a therapy, and they're trying to use it either differently, a different schedule, or perhaps in combination with some other drugs for the first time. So they often know a little bit about the drug and what to expect, but they really still need to understand, can they give these drugs safely to patients um, and they do that usually in a controlled manner. And by controlled, what I mean is they only enroll a certain amount, a small number of patients at a time, and then they follow those patients before they expose more patients to maybe a higher dose or different schedule. Um, so those are phase one trials. Now, the advantage of phase one trials for patients and families, I would say, is it's, it is the access point to the brand new stuff. So if you're really wanting to look at a cutting edge, you know, drug or technology, it's going to start in phase one. The downside of phase ones is that I can't give you, you know, a, a 20 page pamphlet and tell you that a thousand patients have been treated and that the side effect rate is 25 to 29% exactly. Can't do that. I mean, because that's what the phase one trials are, are doing. Um, so I think there's, there's upsides and downsides to those, and that's what a phase one trial is about. Phase two trials, again, in general, these are usually after a drug or a therapy has gone through the phase one portion, and we've, we've determined, we've, we think we've figured out the safe dose to give or the safe schedule. And we think that this particular approach is probably best suited for bladder cancer patients. So in phase two, what we're gonna do is we're only gonna enroll bladder cancer patients to this therapy at the schedule or dose that we've figured out from our phase one portion. And so in the phase two, we're still looking at safety. But in phase two, what we really wanna hone in on is we wanna, we wanna hone in on what is gonna be the deciding factor for us about a new therapy approach that is gonna tell us we think there's enough results in terms of cancer control that it warrants going further to a practice changing often global study so phase two studies a lot of times you'll see them they might be maybe 30 to 100 patients but they usually all have a defined group of patients often with a same cancer type now some phase twos may have a couple cancer types but they usually are say they, they're coning down so they're getting a little more specific to say, we really want to know if this therapy is going to work in bladder cancer patients. Um, some phase twos uh, are uh, trials in which there may be um, essentially a flip of a coin. They may have different sort of arms on them. Um, there are not generally phase two trials in which there are arms in which patients do not get the standard of care therapy. That, that, that would be unethical and is not something that we can do anymore, really ever. Um, and then phase three is sort of the final step 
to getting to, I would say, an FDA approved indication for a therapy. So in a phase three trial, you, you really have to compare a new therapy to what is the standard therapy. Phase three trials are generally large. Um, those are generally not trials that we're leading only at Hopkins at the GBCI. They usually are often global trials, sometimes even up to a thousand patients or more. Um, those trials often do involve a step that is called randomization. And that, that means that the patient is randomly assigned to either standard of care or standard of care with a new therapy. Now, unfortunately, I've had patients ask me this several times, I don't get to pick. <laughs> I wish I did, but I don't. I mean, that's actually the purpose of the randomization is to make sure that as best we can, that patients on both arms of therapy are as equal as possible for everything that we know might affect how they do. Um, and if a trial shows a benefit in phase three, then usually the next step is the FDA looks at that information and they decide, is this drug now approved, again, or a device or therapy? Is it approved for the general public to be used everywhere? Um, so, I think what you will notice if you look for clinical trials for bladder cancer, which is, I think, a great thing, is it's very confusing now to look at clinical trials because there are so many. Um, that's a really good problem to have. Um, we are here to help you uh, to, to sift through that information. Um, I can tell you firsthand, we did not have that problem even five years ago. Um, so this is a challenge, and it's something that we have to step up and, and step to the plate and be there for our patients, and also how we design our trials. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a much better landscape to be in. Um, so I'm going to stop there, because uh, again, we could go on and on, and I know there's others that have much, much more uh, fascinating parts of our program that we want, want to highlight, but I'd be happy to answer questions at the end. Thanks so much. Thank you. So thank you, um, Stephanie and David, for the wonderful uh, introduction. And thanks to all of you for coming today, because it's a beautiful day outside. Um, I just want to start with um, kind of a little bit of background in coming to this team. I remember seeing press releases about when Noah was um, recruited to Hopkins, and then when David came down um, and the Greenberg Institute was formed, and I thought, wow, they are just getting the absolute best of the best to go to Hopkins, and they are just absolutely committed to understanding and getting rid of bladder cancer, and how exciting is that? And boy, that would be a dream job, and um, I'm, I'm really honored to be here um, sitting in front of you today. Um, it, this team is just absolutely amazing. So m my part uh, in this and my passion really is, you know, comes from talking to patients and talks uh, comes from um, you know hearing people's stories coming in with the diagnosis of bladder cancer um, and maybe it's because I'm a woman and maybe because I work with a lot of guys um, but you know some women do have a different story than some men coming in with a diagnosis of bladder cancer and um, you know women tend to just be used to seeing blood I don't think it is that alarming to us um, but when it happens later in life um, and people call and try to get medical attention, um, sometimes the route to a doctor's office and a urologist's office is different for men and women. And we know that when people are eventually diagnosed with bladder cancer, that men tend to get diagnosed a little bit earlier than women. We know that women tend to have more prescriptions for antibiotics than men. Um, is that because maybe women have had urinary tract infections before and thinks that's what it is? Is it because they go to a PCP or go to a GYN? We don't exactly know, but we know, and it's be, been reported that there are, there are differences and there is a difference in terms of time to diagnosis. We also know that when women are diagnosed with bladder cancer, that they tend to be diagnosed at a later stage than men. Is it because of that difference in time? We don't necessarily know that. Is it because of a difference in biology of the tumor? We don't necessarily know that either. But we also know that while they're waiting to be diagnosed, they're sitting in waiting rooms that tend to be filled with not other women with bladder cancer and maybe men with prostate cancer and things like that. So, um, you know, hearing the narrative um, of women for the past eight years that I've been uh, taking care of patients with bladder cancer, 
Um, I've said, yes, we know that this exists, this has been reported, um, but as an individual doctor, um, I, I, I never really had the power to necessarily do anything about it, or didn't think I did, I guess. And um, when this opportunity came up, and I remember sitting with David and Stephanie and having a discussion, is this a problem that's important to me? And I said, oh my God, absolutely, this is a problem that's important to me. And to have the opportunity to, to understand this better and to try and do something to impact on the differences that we see between men and women in bladder cancer, um, this is just a really inspiring uh, thing that uh, I get to do, and I'm honored to do it as a part of the Greenberg Bladder Cancer Center. Um, you know, so there's different components of what we're trying to build with the Women's Bladder Cancer Program, really understanding the differences, understanding the differences in terms of time, understanding is there any actual biologic impact of maybe more antibiotic prescriptions early on. We don't, we don't know the answer to those questions. And as you start thinking about this, as you start thinking about the differences between men and women, every day we're coming up with different questions. Even yesterday, Noah and I were having a chat about something else, and then all of a sudden we said, did anyone ever look at this before? So every day it's this volume of questions and work that can be done to understand and potentially impact on the quality of care and the quality of life with women with bladder cancer is what we're building and what we want to tackle. Um, you know, there's another question too in terms of biology and really understanding and building a database, building um, through the Precision um, Medicine Center of Excellence the biggest data set that we possibly can so we can look at, you know, biologic differences between men and women and how women's tumors might be different and how we might even develop specific therapies for women or for certain women with, with certain tumors that behave in a, in a certain way. And we would do that in the context of clinical trials. And then finally, I think we, we want to impact and improve upon awareness and quality of life. Um, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know that if there's two or three prescriptions of antibiotics that maybe a urologist is the next step. And so I think just general awareness that um, bladder cancer exists in women it's not just a men's disease, is um, something I want to tackle, and really to understand an impact upon quality of life. Um, things like sexual function, um, things like urinary function, um, all these things later in life, things that we don't feel comfortable talking about in, uh, in a mixed group of people. We, we want to be able to tackle those issues and help women uh, with bladder cancer and learn from women with bladder cancer because the experience is yours and not ours, and we want to learn from each and every woman that's had bladder cancer so we can help others with the same disease. I'm going to pass it over to Max Gates now. I, I get very excited, so I need to keep the mic away from me, especially when I'm talking about bladder cancer. Um, so uh, it's, it's such a joy to be here, be on this panel. Um, as you probably realize, our goal all of our goals is to be a global leader in bladder cancer scientific discovery and bladder cancer patient care, both. And the question is, how do we get there? And there's a couple ways, obviously, dedication, commitment, hard work, but simply getting an oncologist in a room with a urologist, with a, a genomic scientist, with a radiation oncologist, with a pathologist, physically together is an incredible way to begin accomplishing that goal. And one of the very special things as, as a surgeon from the surgical standpoint um, about, about what we're trying to do is to have a physical open line of communication at least weekly, sometimes, bi -week, uh, sometimes twice a week. Um, additionally, I, I wanna say that from on the surgical standpoint, um, we have a very large and wonderful team. Uh, one, of, one of our urologists that I've learned a lot from is actually in this room. Phil, do you mind just stand up and introducing yourself? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Molly and Rachel, do you mind standing up and introducing yourself? Yeah, so, uh, you know, they, 
you know, obviously, uh, Dr. Parazio with uh, Trinity Bivalacqua and Mike Johnson, um, you know, we uh, are primarily the, the surgeons who are treating bladder cancer, but there is a team of, of people that go way beyond the, the surgeons that deliver surgical care and deliver excellent surgical care, both in the outpatient setting and in the inpatient setting. And the team approach cannot be uh, emphasized enough. Um, you know, the, the Greenberg Bladder Cancer Institute was, was started several years ago, but our tradition in bladder cancer goes, goes way back here at Johns Hopkins. We first delineated the staging for bladder cancer, one of our own urologists, and many of us were taught by Mark Schoenberg, who uh, was, was one of the leaders in, in uh, the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network and um, uh, was a major surgical presence here uh, at Johns Hopkins. So we always start uh, as surgeons by trying to figure out how do we preserve the bladder? How do we preserve quality of life? How do we preserve a patient's normal day-to-day -day activities? Um, and that's really important to emphasize uh, because surgery does not start in the operating room. It starts in the patient clinic um, and it starts um, by continuing to learn about novel treatments, novel non-surgical treatments that are continually being developed and revolutionizing uh, patient care. Uh, one example is that uh, we are at the forefront of treatments for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, where we remove a tumor uh, through a small camera, you often using new uh, imaging that helps uh, turn tumors blue, that's called blue light cystoscopy, or helps turn tumors actually pink. Um, and after that treatment, we are developing new therapies intravesically to treat bladder cancer um, in order to preserve the bladder. Uh, we are also uh, obviously leaders in, with Dr. McConkey um, in sequencing tumors, and so we're trying to predict who will, who can we uh, treat intravesically one more time uh, with, and avoid uh, a cystectomy on where you remove the bladder and uh, who might need to go to the operating room because they're at higher risk and who, whose bladder might need to come out. Um, for another thing I want to emphasize is that uh, surgeons, it's not just about the, the operating room. There are multiple uh, studies that have come out that suggest that in addition to surgery, we need to be working with our medical oncology colleagues to give chemotherapy or immunotherapy before or after, depending on, on the situation, um, a, a surgical intervention. So that's another reason why it's absolutely important that we all are continuing to, to talk every, at least once a week, if not more often. Um, and then when it comes to to something that a lot of patients always ask about, which is um, I have muscle invasive bladder cancer, I've gotten uh, chemotherapy before, a planned cystectomy, uh, I need my bladder removed, what, what are the options? And so that is always a conversation that we have with the patient and, and it, a lot of that is trying to understand what are a patient's goals. Um, every cancer is different. Um, and every patient's quality of life uh, goals are different. So whether we uh, devise an ileal conduit, um, where, which is where a small piece of intestine um, comes out to the skin to passively drain urine, or we develop uh, a neobladder, which is where uh, bowel is, is utilized to make uh, a bladder on the inside and reconnected to the urethra, um, each patient is different. And there are uh, many resources that patients can utilize. Um, uh, we have uh, several, several people here from the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. I always give the, the, the patient resources, uh, their patient resources, particularly uh, regarding uh, surgery and urinary diversion and those kinds of questions because they are incredible. But there are other patient resources that uh, we give out as well to help make those um, difficult yet important uh, decisions and as surgeons we are uh, 
responsible for helping patients make those important decisions. So I'll stop there um, to allow uh, for help, you know, to, to expand to the audience for, for questions. Um, uh, so thank you. So just in closing, before we open this up, I wanted to just kind of highlight one set of clinical trials that actually Beacon has been helping support through an innovation award that we have in conjunction with MD Anderson Cancer Center. And this involves a class of agents called FGF receptor inhibitors. And the exciting thing is that a lot of our sequencing efforts here are actually st be still being complemented by sequencing efforts that we're still leading at MD Anderson. And there's a huge flood of really uh, exciting stuff coming out in this field right now. Um, one of the drugs, Ertafitinib, is uh, basically uh, looks like it's demonstrating very promising activity in patients with these types of mutations. And we've got a really important biology study where we're getting biopsies from patients before and after therapy with another drug called B701, which is a blocking uh, antibody, kind of like the immune therapies that NOAA is treating patients with right now, but instead of activating the immune system, this one blocks this receptor. Uh, and the, uh, the companies are starting to contact us to do more and more sequencing, so um, it looks as though this is going to be a very kind of transformative time for us to understand this target and one that seems to be having good clinical activity. So I'm going to be the ringleader here and uh, take any questions you might have for any one of the members of our panel. That's a universal comment. <laughs> yeah, it's very simple. So one of our challenges is that the multidisciplinary clinic that you've been hearing about will be the source of that information in a one-on-one, person-to-person -on -one, -person way. So I think the Beacon materials are absolutely transformative. Uh, the Inspire website, we've heard a lot of positive things about that. Uh, we would like to have a person in place to sit there and deliver these materials to our patients, and that is coming in July. So, so the point is that we, we want to actually build the education piece around this, so it's not just you having to go to a website or you picking up a brochure, but after you have ingested it, you have someone to talk to. Because, in part because of the surveillance. 
So your, your question is, your question is an excellent one. Um, the bladder sheds its own normal cells. Bladder tumors shed tumor cells. So a reasonable person would ask, well, can we detect a tumor recurrence simply in the urine? And this is the concept of urine cytology. And as some of you know, because you've been in clinic hearing us say this, urine cytology is more than imperfect. About half the time, about half the time there's a cancer there, uh, or about it overpulsed cancer and underpulsed cancer. So we and others are working on uh, novel urine testing to see if we can avoid cystoscopy. Are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. But one of our goals is to make discoveries in the exact situation you're referring to, which is can we pick up cancers in the urine and avoid cystoscopy? I think. Um the only thing I'd add on that, too, also for the, the patient perspective to understand um, how some of these new tests are being developed is we, we have to decide, you know, as physicians but also as patients, what we're willing to miss if we bring a new technology forward. And what I mean by that, and, and Max, please comment on this, um, I think from the clinician standpoint, we're most worried about missing the high-grade, rapidly growing, potentially lethal bladder cancers. Um, those we have a little bit better success, you know, at, at, at picking up in some of the urine-based technologies. What we have a harder time with is some of the ones that are still clinically important, but some of the low-grade ones that are not life-threatening, but they recur. And so if we got to a point where we had a test that was very good at picking up the life-threatening cancers and we felt really confident that yeah a urine-based test would do that and you might be able to avoid you know cystoscopies as frequently the cost of that might be that we would miss a low-grade one and we pick it up you know three six months down the road it might be a little bigger but still low grade um, and so there's a challenge when we're developing these new diagnostics and I don't think any of us knows how that's going to pan out uh, but there's a balance in terms of what are we trying to find and is each test the best test to find that specific answer. And I think what you will find is that the technologies are, there's not any single one that is, is, is perfect like across the entire spectrum. Um, and I think that's in flux. So I think, you know, as each conference we go to, we see some new things come out, and, uh, but we're not there yet. <laughs> In, in, in terms of avoiding cystoscopy, would you agree? Yeah. I would say, I, I would be surprised yeah. if in five years, um, patients routinely are undergoing four cystoscopies a year, yeah. as many of them are. That, that would surprise me because the, the technology is, is changing so rapidly that I don't think cystoscopy will ever go away, but I think frequent cystoscopy ultimately will uh, decline as some of these uh, adjunct tests uh, become more reliable. So Max and Noah, maybe I could ask each of you, put you on the spot. So Max, what's your favorite emerging new technology to complement or replace cystoscopy? I think we are discovering it here uh, at the GBCI. I think uh, it, we haven't created it yet, but what, what we want to do is uh, find a genomic-based uh, marker or signature in the urine um, that uh, can reliably find bladder cancer. So that's our job. That's, I'm going to put it back to you. <laughs> no, it's, it's Noah's turn. Yeah. So I think it's sort of along those lines, but I think there are some new technology. We talk about circulating tumor DNA. Um, that's the ability to find fragments of the cancer DNA. And a lot of this is being developed in patients with advanced disease in the blood. Um, I think there are some promising um, early results of looking at similar things in the urine. Um, but I think the one that I think is the most promising to me is, is a platform that actually tries to develop, if you will, a personalized monitoring uh, 
sort of test for each patient. It's a little bit out there, uh, but that, that to me is what I think we might need to do on an individual patient basis. So if I had to vote today, that's what I'd say. I totally agree with you. So that's my favorite. So what we do, and this is being done by, by collaborators, um, uh, particularly Lars Discott, who's in Denmark. We talked about this meeting. He was at our meeting. We see him all the time now. It's great. Um, Lars sequences the tumor and then creates a designer assay based on that sequence. So you get your own personal assay, and he's using that assay both in the blood to detect what we might call subclinical metastatic disease, but also in the urine, where it seems to be almost easier. Assay is a measurement. A measurement. So he takes a fancy technique, he takes your urine, and he looks for your specific cancer mutations in the urine. Very sensitive approach. Uh, Bert Vogelstein's group here has a similar assay that they've developed as well that, that we help fund. So uh, that's my favorite too, Noah. Question? Please. So maybe Jeannie and Max, you can comment about upper trying. Tumor and they're concerned that it's invading 
into adjacent structures, in, into the ureter, into what we call the renal pelvis, then there's a discussion about getting chemotherapy. So some of you may have had chemotherapy prior to having your bladder taken out. It, having tumors that arise either in the ureter, which is the straw that connects your kidney that makes the urine down to your bladder that holds your urine, having tumor in that structure, which is a little north of the bladder, or in um, what's called the renal pelvis, not the kidney spongy part itself, but when the kidney makes urine and then dumps it into a small reservoir called the renal pelvis, it's the same tissue type as you have in your bladder, which is much more common to have the tumor there. So we know less about tumors that happen in that location. We know less about do they respond to chemotherapy. We know less about is the biology the same exactly as the bladder, but that's part of the mission of the GPCI is figuring that out and actually doing specialized clinical trials for patients that have tumors in those locations. Um, so right now we have a uh, clinical trial, again, I might pass it back to Max, um, called a mitogel. So that's a, a um, clinical trial where um, a, a substance that, that kind of congeals and, and has the chemotherapy in it is put up into the upper tract for uh, patients who have tumors that are really hard to treat um, in those locations. And then um, as part of a bigger uh, clinical trial network, we're going to be um, hopefully leading uh, a new clinical, we're just finishing up one, hopefully leading another chemotherapy trial for patients that have a high grade of upper tract tumors. Uh, I just want to jump off of the, the scenario that you gave, which is that you, you, know, you mentioned that you know, rheumatoid arthritis. There are some patients that can't get BCG, and uh, BCG doesn't, doesn't work in all patients. Um, and so we are actively pursuing different types of intravesical treatment for patients like yourself in clinical trial settings. Um, who, uh, where BCG is either contraindicated or BCG is just not working. So um, BCG is not the end all, uh, and there are other roads ahead. Yeah, and I, I'd only add just one comment about sort of I think some of the therapy options or scenarios that you asked about the HLA B27 and other things. Um, one thing I want everyone here to understand about the GBCI is that the word can't is not in our vocabulary. Um, so I think, you know, when patients have bladder cancer uh, and other cancers, I, I sometimes use this analogy and um, I talk about it a little bit in golf and I know not everybody's a golfer and I will not claim that I am a golfer either. Um, what I do on a golf course cannot be called golf, but I do like being there. Um, but there's a saying in golf that like when you, when you hit a ball, you have to play the ball where it lies, okay? And what that means is that when you hit it behind a tree and you made a bad shot, you, you don't get to kick it back in the fairway, which we do on the weekend. <laughs> it means that you have to figure out a new option about how to best get to the hole. And, and I, I think that's true for all cancer patients. You know, there's a perfect world of, all right, perfect, someone comes in and they really are some Olympic triathlete and they can take is any drug that we give them because they're in unbelievable shape and they're willing to take it and do it. Um, but that's not, that's not life. Um, so when it comes to like HLA B27 and so forth, um, we know patients who have autoimmune diseases or rheumatologic diseases or genetics that may predispose to more uh, prone inflammatory reactions to infections, insults, or cancers. Um, we know that they're at higher risk, you know, if we used an immune therapy treatment. But I think one of the things that has been really rewarding for me individually about being here at Johns Hopkins and the GBCI is that we have physicians and teams that um, are highly focused, and so they've seen a lot of the, a lot of the sort of unusual or outliers. Um, they've hit their shots behind the tree a lot, and so they've actually gotten pretty good at curving a ball around a tree. <laughs> um, so we have a discussion, and I think a frank discussion with patients about what we can do, what we know are the known sort of risks or side effects, and then I think we try as best we can to be upfront with, with our patients and their families about what are the aspects that we actually just don't know. You know, this is a therapy that we could, could entertain. We don't know how it's gonna turn out. 
Um, and I think when we have those kinds of discussions with patients and families, what, what I find is that, um, you know, many of our patients understand that and they're completely willing to understand that there are certain aspects that we can't predict and don't know. And they may not choose to take maybe a more risky therapy, but some of them will. And I think if they do in an appropriately sort of counseled session where we're all prepared about what would happen if this is best case and what are we going to happen if this whole thing goes terribly wrong, um, then I think that's actually, you know, the way that sort of joint shared decision making should be done. Um, do we do that perfectly? No. Um, but I think that's what our goal is. Other questions? Yep. Um, the short answer is yes. So almost all clinical trials, not all, but almost all of them will tend to follow patients after their disease. Maybe it hasn't worked on that trial and they move on to other therapies or, or just how they're doing. They tend to track them long term. Um, so we do get that information. I think one of the things that maybe is a field that we're not... Um, we're not as good about that I think we need to get better about is then coming back and reporting those longer term results. I think there's a tendency to look at the initial sort of first wave of a trial. Oh, it looks very pot, looks good. Let's, let's move on, let's move it forward, a drug gets approved. But even in trials that don't work, I think there's an incredible amount of information there that can be very, very helpful you know, to patients and other uh, trials to come. Um, to make the future trials have a higher chance of working, but also to make sure that, you know, that we don't repeat things that, that didn't work. Um, so we probably do need to do a better job of that, I think, as an entire field of, of coming back, particularly with some of the larger trials, um, where there's a wealth of information uh, in smaller groups, you know, within the larger uh, number of patients that went in, that maybe there is a signal of something that we didn't see before. Other questions? Sure. Keep going. Yeah, so, so do any of the therapies that we give in trials, um, do they, event, and down the road, do we ever learn that they actually cause cancer, like a different cancer, or are there any that may accelerate the growth of the cancer we're trying to treat? Um, I would say that the simple answer is very, very rarely do any, do those scenarios work, but they have. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, there was a trial that was launched, 90, 99, 99, 20, <laughs> Anyway, this was for this was for prostate cancer back uh, almost 20 years ago. That used a drug at that time was a chemotherapy drug called mitoxantrone. Um, mitoxantrone at that time for prostate cancer had only been shown to help with symptoms for patients with advanced prostate cancer, and it did do that. They felt better. They had less pain. Um, this trial was being done after surgery to see could we cure more men with prostate cancer, and what we learned with that is that. In the group that got the mitoxantrone, there was a small but real uh, increased rate of patients who developed a leukemia. It was very rare, but um, this is something with that class of drugs that we believe that probably that drug caused it, and that it wasn't just, you know, a uh, random event. Um, so we do see that occasionally, but it's, it's very rare, especially as they get further along in development, because of those kinds of events if a patient develops a cancer of any type on a clinical trial, it has to be reported directly to the FDA, um, whether we thought the drug had anything to do with it. So if you're on a bladder cancer trial and your primary care doctor notices a, a mole that's gotten a little bit bigger and they eventually biopsy it and they show that it's melanoma, um, we have to report that. Now, I don't think the drug probably didn't cause it, especially if we knew that it was a 50-year history and it got there and eventually grew. Um, so I would say it's pretty rare, uh, but uh, you know, with any new agent, particularly if we're 
trying to target, you know, specific DNA and genes, um, we have to follow that. Yeah. I wanted to see, I wanted to see two questions. Of course, the effect that you would see may not happen right Right. You don't follow up after your child cries out. Yeah. A year later, something happens, you don't follow up. There's no way to know that. I, I'd like to hear from others on this, but what I will say in, in that is, um, in, in my my former institution before I came to Johns Hopkins, I was at Indiana University, and we saw a lot, a lot of testicular cancer patients there. And one of the things that we learned in that disease, and this applies to Hodgkin's disease and a lot of child, childhood tumors, um, is that some of the therapies that we gave that we did see at events happen 15, 20 years later, and that did change practice over time as we learned how to cut back on therapy. Um, what I, what I say in this situation, especially for advanced bladder cancer, like we're in the metastatic setting, um, I guess right now that I, I'd, I'd be happy to have that conversation 15 years from now if we change that cure rate and that we've got 90% of our patients living there and we learn that 15, 20 years later that they develop something else that we can prevent. Um, I, I, I want to... I want to be there to see that, um, and that's what we're shooting for. We're not shooting to give you more cancer, but but um, but that, in a strange, weird way, that will be a sign of Mark's success um, for our patients living long. Maybe Noah uh, talked to you more about the late and long-term effects of getting chemotherapy or potentially being on a clinical trial. What, what we know, but what you might not know, even if you do on a clinical trial, is that there are safety rules written into clinical trials such that if we see something, even if a clinical trial is being run at 100 sites, if we see something and say this is incredibly unusual, or if there's a significant event, or if there's enough of them that happen in sequence, the trial is put on hold. Um, so for every trial, we recognize that it might not be an acceleration cancer, but, the, but if it is, and if it's something incredibly unusual, that that there's automatic safety built, built into these studies so, so we can recognize that, even if it's not within the same center. So one of the last things that we're doing, um, I, can see, I can see during the study, that's very easy, to do, two years after the study, the guys who got out, if you don't follow them, you don't know. Yeah, they, they usually are following them, though. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, sometimes it's just a phone call, but it's still yeah. a call in saying, how are you doing, what's going on, So the, the, one of the things about our Precision Medicine Center of Excellence and Multidisciplinary Clinic is that should you elect to be, be our patient for life, and we'll be following you and your data with all of that in mind. So, I mean, the point is this is the way it should be done everywhere, right? And we should be thinking uh, in advance about what questions we want to ask and have answered to put in our data sets. And, you know, so that's, that's another evolving thing is that as we learn more, maybe we need to know whether you had antibiotics for six months before you had your BCG. Because maybe the antibiotics are undermining the effects of the BCG. We don't know that yet. So, And then finally, to Noah's point, so I've heard the same thing from Noah and Jeannie and also Arlene Seeker radke a colleague of mine at MD Anderson, and that is that they're seeing more brain metastases. And the irony there is that that's because people are living longer. <laughs> so, so, I mean, the point is we, we have to try to, to address what's right in front of us first. And then if, if, you know, something we're doing is, is somehow causing an increased risk, maybe 5%, but that's a maximum increased risk of some detrimental effect 15 years from now, we can live with that. Because we, we got beyond the, the six months that we were facing otherwise. So it, it, it's, it's not perfect, but it, it's definitely an improvement that we're seeing more brain metastases, ironically enough. I'm going to ask a question. Um, I, I get this asked a lot, and also I'm really curious. So there are lists and lists of bladder cancer clinical trials. They're incomprehensible. We're, we're trying to put it in a format, at least, that we can understand it that's written in English. So to Noah and Jeannie and even to Max, um, who qualifies for a trial? Um, do you recommend the trials, or do people come to you saying, I want to be on that trial? Um, uh, is, are there trials for non-muscle disease? Um, starting up, or is there, are there trials for that? And can you explain, um, are trials for free? Uh, 
who pays for them, how do you qualify, what if you don't qualify. Um, I get this asked a lot, and maybe you're curious, and maybe if you um, are also asked this question a lot, you can help share the information, because this is kind of what I've heard that people are really super interested in, which is why we picked the topic today. Our answers. <laughs> <laughs> the way that I think about clinical trials, and I, you know, I get up every day to, to, to participate in, in clinical trials from a physician standpoint um, because they are the future and, and how we're going to improve this disease. The way, the way I think about it, and what, when I explain it, is that everything we know about fire cancer, every new drug that's coming out, every promise that we have, is because of a clinical trial. Everything I know about how to treat the person in front of me is because someone who sat in that chair five years ago was on the front of And that's a, it's exactly how medicine moves along. Um, do you qualify to be in a clinical trial? Probably, in some fashion, because there's all different kinds of trials. When um, we think about bladder cancer and we develop clinical trials, this is the way I think about it, is bladder cancer has different disease states. So someone can have a non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and has never been treated before. That's a disease state. That's someone who may just get a transurethral resection and then they may need BCG. Can we add something to that? Can we add an imaging modality to that? That's a clinical trial. Can we add a urine test? That's a clinical trial. Someone had BCG and it didn't work at all and they had progression of disease. That's a different disease state. That's a new state. So that's a new clinical trial, new, a new question that we can ask. And really that's what clinical trials are. It's us asking questions and trying to answer them in the most comprehensive, scientific way and economic way possible. And I mean economic in terms of, we know that there's a person on the other end of this that's going through this. We want to be able to do this as efficiently as we can and to answer as much as we can from this experience. Um, so yeah. I mean, I, I think about it very similarly. Um, you know, I, I, I think one of the things I hear from patients a lot is that um, they often think of clinical trials as a last ditch resort, you know, that they should think about when they've gone through all other therapy options. Um, I actually think about the exact opposite. I, I, I think, to me, I, I, I think about a clinical trial in every treatment decision. Every time there's a change, like if a tumor has come back, okay, what are our standard options? What are our trial options? Um, and, you know, we have some patients that have elected to go on a clinical trial multiple times, you know, at different steps of disease. Um, so I, I think, um, to me, I would, I would want to be in a clinical trial, and I will preface that though, that I would, there's certain things that I would want to look at from a patient's perspective. I mean, I'd want to know what's known about the drug. You know, is it brand new? Is it first in human? You know, what do we know about the risks? Do we know anything about early results? You know, is there any promise if they treated 50 patients and it's been reported, it looks like promising? You know, are we further along? Um, will, do I know, will I get the drug for sure? You know, or is there another arm on there that is the standard of care? Um, that might affect whether I decide to do the trial or not. Um, as far as the question you had, I think about costs. Um, so clinical trials, uh, a couple things. If there are things that are being done in the clinical trial, like a procedure, a test, a visit, or something that is not considered a standard of care, you know, we wouldn't be doing it anyway if we were giving you the standard treatment. Um, those are generally paid for by the trial itself. One thing that patients do need to understand is that clinical trials are not necessarily 100% free. So what that means is if we were going to, let's say you're in a trial for advanced bladder cancer that is using immune therapy plus a new drug trying to help the immune therapy. If we were going to be drawing blood tests on, on you every three weeks anyway, as part of your standard immune therapy, then those will be billed to insurance just as if you were not on the trial. So there may be a copay just like you normally would have. What clinical trials should never do, though, is you should not be incurring 
you know, new cost, increased costs, you know, beyond what we would be doing for the standard treatment. And in some cases, it, it, it may actually be cheaper. Um, for us here, we're fortunate that we have a team of folks that look at each individual individual case and they let us know ahead of time that we're okay, you know, on the insurance side and they work with the patients to know that ahead of time. So that's nice for us because we don't, it doesn't have to enter into our discussion with the patients. We just let them know, look, our team is going to look into that. They're not going to do anything until they square it away. Um, so that's a little bit about how I view clinical trials, but you're right, that could go on. Max? Yeah, I'm going to take the, the question in a different direction, which is how do we choose which clinical trials to offer? Uh, because I think that's uh, one thing that I appreciate about our group here is that for the most part, trials that we bring in to the GBCI, into the, the PMCOE, the Precision Medicine Center of Excellence, are vetted by the group. Um, so that means that if there are, there are two to three trials I want to get started this year in bladder cancer, I'm having ongoing conversations with the medical oncologist, with the urologist. This is what this trial is about. This is what we're thinking. What do you think? You think this is something that would help our patients. And so I think that's important because um, there are a lot of trials out there, um, especially now, which is a good problem to have. But it's nice to have a layer of vetting by multiple people in a group saying, yes, this is worthy of our patients. Our patients are special, they're unique, they have serious illness, and this trial is worthy of them. Uh, that's something that I appreciate about the way we do things. Okay, we've got a hard stop in five minutes. So, uh, questions? Didn't mean to shut them down. Yeah. So that's a wonderful question, and um, I wish uh, Trinity Pivolapa was here because he, he's actually been a leader in this exact space. They, uh, I want to say around four years ago, uh, a trial was completed of um, somewhere in the 10, 10 to 12 patient realm where uh, they called it a NUC, and it was exactly what you're saying. It was a synthetically derived uh, bladder what, uh, it wasn't a it was a it was a conduit that was brought up to the skin, but it was not using bowel, um, which completely changes that surgery, completely changes the complications. Um, and what they found was very promising. Initially, the for the most part, the the NUX did did well. Um, although ultimately, they went on to uh, uh, have narrowing structures where the ureter meets the synthetic bladder and many of them had to be explanted and converted into our typical uh, oil conduit. Now you could view that trial as a failure or you could view the trial as a success. I think it sort of depends on um, your viewpoint, but I think what can be said is that we learned a lot from it and there are several, uh, several teams of, of scientists and, and surgeons and everyone working on that question here and throughout the world. Um, I hope that's the future. Uh, yeah, I think it is the future. And I think what he said about Trinity's work. So Trinity's actually giving two talks on this at the upcoming American Urological Association annual meeting in San Francisco next week. Uh, it's also one of the, uh, Stephanie mentioned some collaborations we've established. We've got one with Jennifer Southgate at the University of York who is also a developmental biologist and knows how the urethelium develops when you're in utero, when you're an embryo. And uh, she's using that information to help us design strategies to do just what you said, which is tissue engineering is, is the term for it.
So you mean literally taking a bladder out of one individual and putting it into another? I'll let Max answer that question. Okay. Well, the, the way I'll answer that question is there's, um, we don't typically transplant uh, uh, into patients with cancer. Um, and, and the reason for that is um, it's widely thought and known that, that um, giving the, the immunosuppressive medications uh, um, can potentiate the cancer, can, can maybe make the cancer worse. So that's not the population that we want to do it in. Um, and there's not as many uh, but not there's not as many benign causes for removing a bladder in which you would want to take uh, a, a bladder, a, 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 you know, another human's bladder and put it in that, and give them lifelong immunosuppressive that many would consider quote unquote worth it for, for that. Okay, one more question. Yeah, so uh, the short answer to your question is yes, it can be converted, but it is a major operation. Um, and that's exactly why the initial counseling pre-op is so important. Um, and, and, and so, yes, it, it, can, it can be converted. So I want to thank our panel, our organizers, uh, all of you, our guests today, I think it's been a really productive and enjoyable lunchtime conversation we've had. And I encourage you to all go out and continue to do what you can to reinforce Bladder Advocacy Month this month. Hopefully we'll see you tomorrow at our walk. Take care.